With much of the world now paying strange attention to the opening of the Vatican archives of Pope Pius XII, some interesting bits of information have already been released that are of special interest to those of us who pay a lot of attention to the crisis in the Church and seek to get a better understanding of just what has been going on in the Church since the Second Vatican Council. Many observers have rightfully said that the years of Pius XII's reign will give us greater insight into how the council happened just four short years after his death. Now some interesting hints of what awaits us are about to be released. Let's have a look at what little has already been made available to the public this week. The information we have is already confirming some suspicions we've long had about the actors at the council. But first I wanted to thank the patrons of this channel for supporting the work I do here. Viewer and listener support really does enable this work to continue. Often, much of what I do here is try to research the various connections between stories to give you a better idea of what is going on, as you'll see in today's podcast. If you want to join the supporters of this channel, you can do so through Patreon or Subscribestar for as little as a dollar per month, or you can click the Join button on YouTube or through the Mail or Subscribestar for single donations. It really does help this channel keep going. And please, if you value the work of your other Catholic content creators, show them some support as well. Thanks. Now on to the story of the Vatican Archives, which is capturing the world's attention. Most of the interest in Pius XII's archives stem from his activity, or if you buy into the popular narrative, lack thereof, during the Second World War, specifically relating to any organized or public opposition to the German regime. You probably already know that Pius XII gets called ugly names regarding his role in the war, and the atrocities committed therein. With the Vatican archives being open to examine internal Vatican communications during the war, the eyes of the world are now on Rome. While all that is interesting, and I'm sure I'll cover that for you next week as information comes out, what's barely getting noticed is the role Pius played during the years leading to the Council, especially during those late years when the modernists were on the rise. The maniacs would eventually win out at the Council, fundamentally changing the relationship of the Church with the world as well as much of her theology, the sacramental rites of the Church, and pretty much anything and everything that touched on the life of faith of any Catholic at any level of the Church, be they laity, religious, or part of the clergy. Many have speculated that Pius XII did little to stop the modernists from gaining power in those years, and may have inadvertently aided them in the, with the promotion of the likes of Annabali Bugnini, the architect of the Novus Ordo Missae. Now, according to the reporting of Edward Petten of the National Catholic Register, we have some clues about what to expect in the coming weeks and months as the archives are examined by scholars and investigators. Petten had an article published earlier this week in the Register that covered the archives, leading with the subject of World War II. Of interest for us today is the subject of the Index of Forbidden Books, which, as Penton notes, was scrapped by Paul VI in 1966. Prior to the scrapping of the index, however, the Vatican was actively updating the list. According to Penton's article, while the Vatican was seeking to find new ways to deal with secular writers, the index was apparently being updated. Quote, Nevertheless, the entire works of authors Alberto Moravia, André Guide, and Jean-Paul Sartre were all included in the index during Pius Pontificate, while requests were made to remove Blessed Antonio Rosmini from the list. Monsignor Chifres, he's the he's one of the Vatican librarians and archivists, mentions that not all agreed with the removal. A priest from Buyino, Italy, called Albino Luciani, later to become the short-lived Pope John Paul I, denounced a pamphlet being circulated in the diocesan seminary proposing a revision of the post-obitum decree that put some of Rosmini's works on the index. And mostly, quote, Okay, so what does that mean? Alberto Moravia was an existentialist writer with a penchant for writing particularly smutty sexual material. He was an avowed leftist and would have been a supporter of the groups that Pius XII's Catholic action organized against in the years following the war. His entire body of work found its way onto the index, which he probably took as a badge of honor. I don't think Jean-Paul Sartre needs an introduction, as he may be the most famous of the existentialist writers of his day. André Guide was another writer with a particularly sexual tenor to his writings. Another avowed leftist, he was a thought leader of the anti-colonialist movement between the two world wars. He worked constantly against Christian morality, calling it a form of puritanical tyranny. Though, to his credit, while he was a leftist, he detested the Soviet Union, so credit where it is due, I guess. All these figures would help lay the groundwork for the world of anti-philosophy that dominates the academic world today. Along with the Frankfurt School figures, the writings of these men helped frame the world we live in. It's little wonder that their works ended up on the Index of Forbidden Books. 
but a special interest to us are the examinations of the then Holy Office into the Modernists, whose erroneous thought would come to dominate the Second Vatican Council. The Holy Office was active in those days, trying to stave off the rising tide of modernism. According to Penton's article, quote, Meanwhile, the Holy Office began, the Monsignor said, to pay attention to authors such as Yves Cognar, Henri-Marie de Lubac, Hans Urs von Balthasar, and Jacques Maritain, who were influential during the Second Vatican Council several years later. But Monsignor Seyfried said the focus was on the works of Ernesto Bonatui, excommunicated in 1925 for his defense of modernism. The Holy Office also examined the works of the French philosopher and theologian Jean Guiton, whom Paul VI would later appoint as the first lay auditor of the Second Vatican Council. End quote. Okay, so many of those figures you hear quoted today by leading figures in the Church. They are respected by the mainstream minds of Catholicism, yet in the years before the Council they were all being observed by the Holy Office under suspicion of heresy. One such figure is Jean Guiton, the figure you hear the least from today. He was quoted in a 1992 book as saying the following of modernism. Brace yourselves for this one. Quote, when I read the documents relative to the modernism as it was defined by St. Pius X, and when I compare them to the documents of the Second Vatican Council, I cannot help being bewildered. For what was condemned as heresy in 1906 was proclaimed as what is and should be from now on the doctrine and method of the Church. In other words, the modernists of 1906 were somewhat precursors to me. My masters were part of them. My parents taught me modernism. How could St. Pius X reject those that now seem to be my precursors? End quote. Think about those words. And remember that Pope Paul VI gave Guton a job as the first lay auditor of the Second Vatican Council. Like I said, Pius XII's archives are a treasure trove of information about the years leading to the Council and the fight against the modernists. But we're not done yet. Penton's peace continues, with the Vatican official in question saying that France was a hotbed of activity for the Holy Office and Vatican investigators during the pontificate of Pius XII. Quote, the nation that aroused most interest for the dicastery during that period was certainly France, he continued, because of new doctrinal currents and revolutionary trends that were developing beyond the Alps. The Holy Office would make a series of denunciations, beginning with the Jesuit father Marcel Bith, and would continue to monitor the writings of Jesuit Father Teilhard de Chardin, an idealist philosopher whom the dicastery had been examining since 1931. The Holy Office would later issue a monitum, or simple warning, in 1962 against uncritical acceptance of his ideas, the main one being that man is evolving, mentally and socially, toward a spiritual unity. The Holy Office also studied other problematic texts coming from France, including a progressivist catechism and French publications such as La Croix, Esprit, Thames Present, and La Quinzaine. The peace movement Pax Christi was also studied because of its possible links with communist thought. End quote. For my money, I think the figure I want to see the most information about in those years is Teilhard de Chardin, who promoted much of the strange evolutionary religious ideas that we hear in passing today, including some of the language of the cosmic Christ we heard being used by the Amazon Synod in its initial working document. And it was also suspected, given his own diaries and the things he wrote in there, that he may have actually been demonically possessed, for what that's worth. What I really want to know, though, is why he wasn't more actively combated in those years, as his ideas became so widespread that even Father Ratzinger at the time praised Chardin. There is also mention made of information about otherwise forgotten alleged Marian apparitions that investigators paid little attention to, likely because the local ordinary didn't think they were even remotely valid. That information should be interesting if it sees the light of day, as it could give insight into why the local ordinaries and Rome never approved apparitions like Bayside, Garen Vandal, and others that I know some in this audience have a special interest in. The potential for seeing inside the works of the investigators of alleged apparitions is especially important for those who ca care about Catholic prophecy and the like, so pay attention to that information as it comes out, and feel free to forward any stories about that as they emerge to me, please, but make sure they're focused on the Pius XII archives and not random things from blogs on the internet. But there is a narrative that the world is going to almost certainly go with. One headline I already saw accuses Pius XII of remaining silent during the atrocities in the war. No context about the situation the Vatican was in during that time is given. You know, no mention that it was surrounded on all sides by essentially an enemy state. I went into this already in my video on Pius XII last week, and if you haven't watched or listened to it, I recommend that you do so. 
By now, if you're listening to this, you're already used to the church being smeared by the world, so new allegations against the church probably won't bother most of you all that much, all things considered, but still, be ready for them. For once, the, church, the words of someone who works in the Vatican at the moment are applicable here and are quite wise. Cardinal Mendoncha, the Vatican's chief librarian, has been widely quoted as saying, The church is not afraid of history. And that is true. There's nothing to apologize for here. One of the things that the anti-church forces in the world love to do is to revise history, to critically study history in order to expose the faults of those who came before, all in an attempt to destroy the cultural institutions that are the bedrock of Western civilization or Christendom, if you prefer. Don't get caught up in those attempts. It would be an amazing, unprecedented consequence of opening the archives of Pope Pius XII that the crisis of modernism in the church was more fully revealed to the public. If it became known widely that many of the figures respected by very public bishops and cardinals today were suspected of heresy and had their books at least considered for placement on the index. Looking at the index, it is rather revealing how many of those books I had to read in college by authors like John Stuart Mill, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and others who promoted a revolutionary social philosophy that is at odds with Catholicism. It's amazing that these suspected modernists didn't end up on the index themselves. Again, in my mind, the most interesting possibility with the opening of Pius XII's archives is the insight to the late-stage fight against the modernists in the years prior to the Council, and how the Holy Office and the Pope chose to address those figures. So pay attention, because we may get some help in our fight against the modernists from the late pontiff. What do you think of all this? Is the opening of this archive going to be just an unmitigated disaster? Is it weird that the digital archives aren't available to the general public? What are your thoughts on this? Let me know what you think in the comments, and please, consider sharing this video. And if you're not subscribed, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. I upload daily, so you'll get a lot of news in, the sh in short video form so that you can keep up with what's going on. Anyway, thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.